Okay, so now's the hard part. How do you take something as complicated as this? And it's actually extremely simple. If you apply platonic retroductive logic to the principle of gravity, anti-gravity, and weight, um, it's really simple to understand, but complex to explain. Everything that I know of the writings of Oliver Heaviside, James Kirk Maxwell, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, and Nikola Tesla all said the same thing about weight and gravity. First, let's start off by saying that there's no such thing as gravity. The unification of the four fields, electricity, magnetism, dielectricity, and gravity is a foregone fool's errand. They're already unified, and they're only one thing with different modality expressions. Gravity is nothing other than incoherent dielectric acceleration, or what I like to call mutual mass acceleration. But first, let's talk about weight. Weight doesn't exist, said the fat guy, right? But what is weight? Weight. Weight is medium-specific, obviously. How could you get a little five-year-old girl to move around? Um, so what do I weigh? I weigh 260 pounds. How could you get a five-pound girl to move around a 260-pound guy like me? That would be in a medium. That would be impossible unless the both of us are floating in water. Then it's extremely easy for someone like that to move me around or some other extremely large person around. So weight is medium specific, but not only that, it's vector specific. We know that from everything that NASA's done, the approaches of satellites entering Earth's orbit, um, re-entry vehicles, so it is vector specific. And the one thing that uh, modern scientists don't like to admit, even when it comes to weight, is uh, instantaneous change in properties. And it is uh, location specific. Okay, what do I mean by location specific? If you actually change mass 3's instantaneous halving of the distance between mass 1 and mass 3, instantaneous, so we have an instantaneous change in weight simply due to location. But I thought nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. Well, light's not a speed, it's a rate of induction. So weight would change instantaneously upon the change of mass 3 having of the distance relative to mass 1. So right now we know that weight is medium specific, vector specific, and location specific, undeniably so. It's also magnitude specific. This one's harder to actually explain magnitude specific. This actually has to do with geometries of acceleration or acceleration vectors. Like if we actually have mass 3 here relative to mass 1, the acceleration vector geometry is this, but if we actually have mass 3 here, then the acceleration vector has gone from this angle of attack to this angle of attack, so that take a while to explain. So weight is magnitude specific in addition to being location, vector, and medium specific. It's also phase specific, and since everything is electrical, this applies to the right-hand rule. I don't want to get into that too deeply. It'd take a lot longer than one video to explain that. So here we have a lot of different variables relational to weight. Weight doesn't exist. This is an attribute of relative, a conceptual description that humans have relative between two masses or between objects already on Earth. And of course, actually weights change depending on elevation. There's uh, gravitometers which actually show that things weigh different things at different locations on the Earth due to a density, crust thickness, so on and so forth. So right now, there's actually seven different things that pertain to weight being relativistic. Phase, magnitude, location, vector, and medium. These are the five main ones. So weight doesn't exist. There's actually a lot of things that don't exist. There's no such thing as weight. There's no such thing as gravity. And there's no such thing as magnetic attraction. Let's actually talk about that here in just two seconds. Let me actually erase this. Here we have mass one and mass two. What do I mean that gravity doesn't exist? Obviously the phenomenon that we call gravity certainly does exist. We have mutual mass acceleration. Something we actually have to define. These are properties, not attributes, but properties. I'm going to define them as MMA and PSA. MMA and PSA. What's that mean? Here we two have two incoherent masses, say two uh, solar galactic bodies, mass one and mass two, under mutual acceleration either in orbit of one another, 
or accelerating towards one another. And here we actually have incoherent dielectric acceleration or mutual mass acceleration. In other words, the acceleration of two masses towards one another. What would be the definition of point source acceleration? It would be PSA. Instead of mass 1 and mass 2, we also have mass 1 and mass 2. But we have a property that's actually able to hold point source. Yeah, I know these look like breasts, right? This would be point source acceleration. So instead of the vectored acceleration of two mutual masses like this between one another, and point source acceleration, like two magnets, you know, like that monster magnet I got in the mail today, it actually has a pulling force of uh, lifting force or pulling force of 1,400 and some pounds. I think it's like a 20 pound magnet. Now, here's something important. This is PSA. Point source acceleration. This is something that uh, I have a hard time explaining to people. And here we have a cylinder magnet over here, okay? This monster magnet. Neodymium iron boron, samarium cobalt. Doesn't really make any difference. What's the difference in attribute? That when these are actually made, they're made out of ceramic, by the way. Here's our monster magnet with a pulling force of 1,400 plus pounds. LBS, okay? How is it that a simple mass like that is actually able to lift like a 1,400-pound refrigerator or car? Not a refrigerator weighs 1,400 pounds. What's the property of the magnet before it actually becomes a magnet? When it's actually created from uh, a ceramic and then uh, chromium or nickel plated, what's the properties of that magnet before it becomes a magnet? It's no different than any other mass. It has mutual mass acceleration towards any other mass. If we're actually able to make that, you know, the size of the moon, two identical objects, the size of the moon, made out of neodymium iron boron, we would still have MMA. Let me actually erase this mass over here. Mutual mass acceleration. Because it's not a magnet yet. What actually defines a magnet? What defines a magnet is that we don't actually have we we'll say, well, this is a lie in domains. Mutual mass acceleration. This is not mutual mass acceleration. This would be before it becomes a magnet. It's no different than any other mass. It's a lump of ceramic. What happens actually after it becomes a mass? And the geomagnetic precession becomes aligned. What you actually have is a different quality and attribute of point source acceleration. We have a reciprocating precessional hyperboloid. We actually have a toroidal magnetic field around the magnet and a centrifugal convergent hyperboloid or hourglass shape where you can actually simply draw an eight or an affinity figure. This is actually the conjugate geometry of the universe, the toroid and the hyperboloid. Here we actually have point source acceleration or PSA. There's no such thing as magnetic attraction. The same thing that humans stupidly call magnetic attraction is absolutely no different than what the stupid human calls normal gravity. Human falling to the earth. Here we go. Out of an airplane, I used to skydive every day. Can't believe how much skydiving I did. Mutual mass acceleration. So the difference between that and point source acceleration. Well, actually, after this becomes a magnet, there is zero change in the big Q on this magnet, which is quantity. The only difference that's changed is the attribute and the qualitative nature of what it is. There's no difference in weight or mass. There's no difference in anything other than the entire atomic and molecular structure of that neodymium iron boron or samarium cobalt has become point source. Everything is operating within synchronicity. Then things are not additive but multiplicative. So the multiplicative nature of what magnet, what we people call magnetic attraction, how all magnets start pulling towards one another, this is nothing other than point source acceleration or point source gravity. But gravity doesn't exist. Over here we actually have dielectricity, magnetism, and electricity. But electricity is not something different. Everybody likes to think that electricity is one and the same thing. Actually, Tesla, Faraday, Steinmetz, Oliver Heaviside, James Kirk Maxwell all understood what dielectricity is, but you won't find it in modern textbooks called electrostatics or dielectricity. Electricity is phi times psi equals Q and Planck of electrification. Electricity is a hybrid between dielectricity and magnetism. Gravity is what we call 
mutual mass acceleration. It is not an autonomous field modality. The phenomenon we call gravity doesn't exist at all. Magnetism is nothing other than the dielectric field and expressed to the loss of inertia. Like light and illumination, water and wetness, magnetism is the expression of the dielectric field and loss of its energy potential. Literally, magnetism equals F and A, excuse me, F and M, force and motion, dielectricity equals inertia and acceleration. Everything we refer to as gravity or magnetic attraction, which does not exist, neither gravity nor magnetic attraction exists. What it is is inertia and acceleration is dielectric inertia and acceleration with two possible different attributional variances, one being mutual mass acceleration, one being point source acceleration. Let me repeat that specifically and actually encapsulate all three. There's no such thing as weight, as I showed you. Weight has seven different parameters. There's no such thing as gravity. There's no such thing as magnetic attraction. Actually, the notion of attraction or acceleration, which is the opposite of force, is the complete opposite of magnetism. There's absolutely no such thing as uh, magnetic attraction or magnetic uh, acceleration. This is dielectric acceleration of one of two different types, point source or mutual mass acceleration. All three are one thing, dielectric acceleration, be that weight, which has seven different variables, or what we call gravity or the phenomena, which does not exist at all, and uh, what the, the common uh, ignorant and unevolved humans call magnetic attraction. Since everything is the right-hand rule, let me actually talk about that in a second. So, we know that uh, the medium of uh, weight is uh, medium-specific, vector, location, magnitude, phase, and two others, and weight has no meaning since it's a conceptual attribute set of two masses relative to a medium, i.e. the ether. Everything is the right-hand rule. So now I think we have a, at least a f fundamental or rudimentary understanding of mutual mass acceleration, and we've differentiated it out from point source acceleration, or what the ignorant, unevolved human beings call magnetic attraction. Both of these, including weight or dielectric acceleration. And as I said, a pre-magnet has mutual mass acceleration. It's no different than any other mass. A post-magnet, or one, a mass or lump, neodymium, iron, boron, samarium, cobalt, or otherwise, has point source acceleration. This is not magnetic attraction. There's no difference in a magnet before it becomes a magnet and after it becomes a magnet. The difference is the multiplicative nature of the field phenomena which are acting in unison. Remember the old Roman fascia where the sticks are bound together? It's, uh, if you actually bundle ten sticks, it's not ten times harder to break them. It becomes a multiplicatively harder to break those ten sticks. Well, one stick equals one unit of pressure to break. So if we bind ten of them together, it, it should take ten units. That's not the case. It becomes a multiplicative. It's the same thing with magnetism. There's a reason why that lump of a ceramic out there has 1,400 pounds of a pulling force. Why is that with a ferrous object, of course? The reason for that is a point source acceleration. So we actually extrapolate upon this further. Now that we know that everything is unified, electricity is just a hybrid of dielectricity and magnetism. Gravity doesn't exist. Magnetism is literally the dielectric field then we have one thing. Since dielectricity is the magnetic field, we're talking about the conjugate nature of the fundamental principle of nature, which is the hyperboloid and the torus, which together form the holos. There's, an, there's a nice ancient Greek word that everybody should learn. Holos. That's where we get the word holography from. We can actually extrapolate something further and say that there are two types of drive, since everything works off of the right-hand rule, here we could have the Earth, if you will, the Earth or mass one. There are two types of drives. There's only, since everything is the right-hand rule, the only anti-gravity possible are two different types of drives. Drive number one would be, it has to be, a repulsing drive right-hand rule, right-hand rule, RHR. Look up the right-hand rule if you don't know what it is. Okay. This has to be point source. Point source, and this is mutual mass. But the 
but the point source acceleration has to be hyperbolic relative to the mutual mass of mass 1. We could call this mass 2. We have mass 1 or body or the earth down here. So we actually have to have the right hand rule relative to every vector of acceleration. Since we have incoherent matter down here, we actually have to have a mass 2 with point source acceleration right hand rule opposite to the acceleration such that we have this. But obviously this only goes so far. If you're not near any mass, then obviously motion or relative motion is impossible. We're only talking about uh, a drive relative between two masses. The craft, or C, and the mass, which is one, or a body. The other one, since there's only two types, this is the repulsing drive. The only other type, where there's no other second mass, would have to be a focus field drive. Focus field drive. The focus field drive, here we have a craft. Uh, here we go, a focus field drive. where focus field drive which actually creates a null point of acceleration where in which the uh, ship is chasing after a uh, false mutual mass or a dielectric well actually I like to refer to it as a dielectric well some people actually call it a false a false mass I've heard it actually called a false mass before a false mass so this doesn't exist what this is is a field geometry actually created by the actual craft. This is a forced field drive where in which it's actually chasing an imaginary mass. Imaginary mass or false mass. I've heard it actually called a lot of different things. What's happening is is that the, the craft or ship, I guess we could put a person right here, right? Hey, is actually chasing after this. And this is, once again, everything is the right hand, excuse me, thinking 10, I'm always thinking 10 steps ahead about a bunch of different, R, H, R, right hand rule. Everything is the right hand rule. And acceleration here, what we're doing is we're creating a mag field, a mag field perpendicular to the point of acceleration, but we're actually creating a point source acceleration here such that the craft since it has no two masses to accelerate to can travel in whichever direction like this. That has to be the only two possible drives a repulsing drive and a force field drive but importantly this is a this entire video is applying platonic retroductive logic to the right hand rule and everything that I understand from the grand experts and also additional texts like Faraday Steinmetz, Heaviside, James Clerk Maxwell. Heaviside was crazy, but he was a good kind of crazy. He was brilliant. People don't understand this is a multiplicative field phenomena. You actually have all independent atomic masses or molecules operating independently and they do self-canceling, but even though they self-cancel, they still have a mutual mass acceleration like any other mass does. But if you're actually able to make that coherent and create and create a, a vortex here, a vortex here, this is the dielectric hyperboloid and the magnetic toroid, then what you actually have is point source. People don't understand, like before this becomes a magnet, um, it's nothing other than a lump of ceramic. I mean, it's unimpressive, it's unexciting. The entirety of the field phenomena, other than the mutual mass acceleration or mutual gravity, is within inside the mass. But by turning it into a point source acceleration, i.e. field coherency, which is multiplicative, PSA, point source acceleration, then what happens is that the field phenomena completely leaves the actual mass itself. Here's the mass. The mass is now a magnet. 
Everything is field phenomena. Field coherency, point source, acceleration, and everything else is the right-hand rule relative to mass one or the direction of travel. It really can't work any other way than that. I can tell you something for absolute certainty. There's absolutely no such goddamn thing as gravity. There's no such thing as magnetic attraction or acceleration. And it's an established fact that weight has seven different variables. Instantaneous change in distance relative between two masses, mass one and mass two, is an instantaneous change in weight. Weight is also, of course, medium specific. You know, person floating in the, how much does a person floating in the water weigh? What is weight? Well, I step on a scale, that's my, what is weight? There's seven different ways you can actually change weight instantly. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, of course it is. You know? You can actually stick a 10,000-pound uh, boat in the water, and you can get a teenager to move it. And uh, once he starts pushing on, it'll slowly move. And after that, I mean, it only take one hand for a teenager to move a 10,000-pound boat in the water just simply by changing the medium in which the mass is present in. That's a change in medium. Um, the irony of field phenomena and field theory is that it's incredibly simplex, but it's incredibly complex to actually discuss. Anyway, this is what happens when you make videos at 2 o'clock in the morning. But that doesn't make it any less logical than if I were to make it at 2 o'clock in the daytime. 2 p.m. versus 2 a.m. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. And remember... Remember what? Shh. Shit that doesn't exist does not exist. Stuff that doesn't exist. Gravity, magnetic attraction, and weight. Everything is MMA or PSA and everything is the right hand rule. Everything. The only way that gravity, excuse me, the only way that anti-gravity could work is of two types and both types employ point source acceleration field phenomena that are right hand rules to the point of what the direction of acceleration is desired. Um, thanks for watching. Have a nice night. This is your boring field theory video.